now and uh, the floor is all yours, Tashank. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Mahmoud. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor. Um, and thank you for accepting the invitation as well. I know, yeah, of course. Um, uh, and, and thanks everyone for attending. So, so I'm Trishank. Uh, you might have seen me around Twitter. Uh, I'm a self-professed amateur computer scientist. I'm 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 also a very alumnus and instructor, and I also am a physical culturist, uh, which is a fancy way of saying I lift weights from time to time. Um, so, and I'm here today to talk about <clears throat> one of my essays. Hopefully, it ties it all together, and I'll talk about why we're talking about this whole damn thing in the first place, which I think is still a bit important. Why, why creativity trumps IQ? Why IQ is bogus? And I'll discuss this from a computational point of view because I am a computer scientist. I can't help but look at everything from a, <laughs> to us, everything, everything, everything is a you know, computational hammer, right? Everything are nails to us. Um, the whole damn universe is a computer. So why not human beings? Anyway, let's, let's go, sorry. I'll push back against that eventually. Yeah, exactly, yeah. great. Yeah. I, there we go. <laughs> Didn't go without notice. Love it, love it. We'll, Objection we'll in the first minute. I love it. No, no, okay. just just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So so the background. What what triggered all this? Well, as some of you may know, Nassim uh, wrote this epic series of uh, tweet storms against IQ. I think in the middle of 2019. Doesn't doesn't it all seem a bit like ancient history by now? It feels like 20 years ago. But anyway, this happened not more than two years ago. And, and he was calling out, I'm not, I'm not even going to do, um, I'm not even going to name these people. You probably know who, who some of them are. And some of them are openly, quite openly, not all of them, to be clear, quite openly racist. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, even if they don't mean to be explicitly racist, um, their, their agenda seems to be implicitly for it. Now, and I'll explain what that means. So their idea is one, one based on the bell curve, that there is a Gaussian distribution of, of human intelligence that you can measure objectively, right? Precisely, scientifically. So someone with an IQ of 181 is somehow precisely better than someone with 180, somehow at one point makes a huge difference. Is it, is it like the decibel scale? You know, what, what's, the, what's the difference here? They're never clear about it. At least 200 and 100, you can say maybe something. And they also believe that, that, that intelligence is somehow reducible to one dimension, like height or weight. Again, this is not clear. It's not clear why this is the case. Uh, but perhaps the biggest mistake that they make is that this is uh, genetically her heritable, especially over races, the different races. And some of you may be familiar. This is, this is again, I think to me, this is a modern version, modern scientific, pseudoscientific to be clear incarnation of the old idea of phrenology, that some races are just better than others. And we're somehow supposed to, so for example, Indians, for example, supposedly, according to one bogus study, has a national average IQ of 80. Doesn't explain why all the Silicon Valley, most of the Silicon Valley programs are all Indian, but, but somehow with, with, a, with a idiot IQ, somehow we managed to do this. Okay, and so, so, you, you may also be familiar with Nassim and Joe's responses to this, who attack it from a probability and complexity point of view, right, um, um, respectively. And I, I, um, I happen to see it from a computational point of view. As I said, I, I wrote these two, two essays. The first one got a lot, a lot of flack, and we're gonna, which is good. It, it keeps life entertaining. And I'm gonna, talk about, I'm gonna talk about what I think follows from computation, what, what I know from it, what we know from it, and, and, and we'll get there. And I like to present a bottom line first. This is a trick that Nassim taught me, which is that you want to you want to get you want to give people a bottom line first. Okay, so what do I claim? Well, let me put it in 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 Paul Portesi's words: "You do you. That's it. Very simple. If that's the only thing you take away from this talk, that's all I want you to remember. The end. That's it. You can leave now." Um, but really what I'm trying to say is that, so these, these people implicitly claim that basically different races have the sort of uh, the equivalent of different hardware. And I said that this is not true, what we know from computational theory. The different machines are basically, once you reach a certain critical threshold called universality, they're basically the same. And the greatest differentiator between people I claim is what we call software, it's creativity uh, on, the, on the human level. Okay, what we do differently. And I, I like to say that you are part of individuals are part of nature's distributed search to solve problems. And, and what are you here for? You're, you're, you have a unique particular set of skills. 
and and you should find out that what what are you here to do like like paul paul says all the time find your own path right other people have done theirs what's yours what, what are you here to solve okay so so let's start talking about let's start busting iq from the computational point of view and it all began it, it, it all began in the 1900 arguably with a mathematician called david hilbert Actually, the idea of computation goes way, way back. The Greeks had their own ancient computer, but it wasn't universal. Anyway, and we'll get to what universal means. It's an overloaded word, to be fair. So a lot of people misunderstood what I meant. Um, basically, there's a fancy German word, the Unskydungs problem, if I'm saying it right, basically just means the decision problem. Imagine, they basically said, and there's a reason why they wanted this machine. They wanted to solve mathematical problems mathematically. There was a German mathematician called Cantor who wanted to study God and he used infinities, but he studied infinity rigorously. But he used proofs that were very troubling to a lot of mathematicians at the time, even now to some mathematicians. So Hilbert said, hold on, hold on. We don't have to argue about this. He pulled basically a Leibniz. Leibniz also wanted a calculus for objectively solving. And I think Mahmoud can certainly talk more about this. But Leibniz also thought that we could have a calculus for morality, that we could solve. We could just put aside differences and say, let us compute and see who's right. Well, that, that partly led to the, to the machine that we're all sitting on called computers today. Uh, Hilbert and his friends wanted to solve this, this machine. They, they wanted to come up, they, they asked, is there a machine that can solve all decision problems, all the yes or no questions? That's it. Is such a machine possible? What do you think? And, um, and I'll, 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 I'll answer it later on. Um, but basically, that's how we got computers. Imagine how powerful such a machine would be. It would give IYI so much power. For example, you could feed it something like, is the coronavirus a systemic risk? And it would spit out an answer and presumably all IYIs could agree. That would have been nice. At least that would have solved that problem. But anyway, I claim that this is the biggest IYI project of them all with love and affection to these guys who are much smarter than I am, right? Okay, and Turing was a fellow, was the mathematician, an English mathematician who answered this question posted in 1900. And he answered it, I think in 1935, 37, something like that with what we now eponymously call the Turing machine. It's, uh, remember, this guy came up with the idea of a universal machine. I'll talk about what this means. But basically he said, what is a computer? What, what does it mean to compute? Before him, computers actually referred to typically ladies who looked up logarithm tables, for example, to do all this tedious calculations. Remember, we, computers were not around forever. People had to do them manually. So computers literally define, uh, referred to human beings. So he said, let's mechanize that. If I wanted to be objective about it, if I wanted to explain, if I wanted to build a machine that would do what these ladies would do, how would I do it? And at the time we had typewriters, right? We didn't have computers. So he imagined a typewriter that had an infinite tape or at least tape you could keep feeding it forever, right? If you ran out of tape, you just keep building more tape, adding more tape. And it had that idea of a, a limited memory and it could go left and right. It could write new, it could read things on the tape. It could write back to the tape and so on. It's basically, if you, if you think about it, it's roughly what computers today do, no matter how sophisticated they are. And this is a revolutionary idea for its time. And you can see how practical it is. This is a thing you can very, you can explain to high school students and they would get, a, they, would, they would see how it works. Remarkable for its simplicity. Okay, and, and, the way, and the way it relates to our topic is he, remember, he modeled his machine by trying to model how, how you could simulate, how you could copy, how human beings, what does it mean when it, when, when it is said that a human being is said to compute? What does that mean? That's what he tried to codify with his machine. There must be a procedure, basically. There's no magic, ultimately, no matter how tedious the procedure. So he said, ultimately, I should be able to, and he wrote this in the 1950s, actually. He extended his idea later on to human beings, and he said, you know, it's possible that someday, although I think he was a bit premature about it, I think he said something about in a few decades. So no matter how smart you are, you can get these things wrong. But I think the big idea is correct, that ultimately you could build a machine. So the Turing test, he came up with a, 
what, what, what is colloquially called the imitation game. I hope you haven't seen the movie. Hollywood tends to destroy everything it touches. Um, but Turing said, what if I'm in the interrogator in the middle? Right? We don't have to argue about what intelligence means. What does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be conscious? What does it mean to be blah, 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 blah. Let's throw away all of that definition game aside. Let's be practical. If I'm talking to two things over pen and paper, I ask it questions and I don't, and they're both behind curtains. One of them is a machine pretending to be human. And the other one, you know, is a human pretending to be human, not a machine. And the question is, can I, through the series of questions, figure out which one is machine and which one is human? And if I confuse the machine for a human, then the machine is said to have won the Turing test. Because the idea, the, the idea is remarkably simple. Like I said, Turing was a practical guy. He fixed his own bicycle, okay? He said, look, I don't have to worry about what does it mean for a machine to be intelligent? All, if, if something looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it is a duck for all practical purposes. Okay, that's, that's all I need to worry about. So if something looks human, if you're fooled into thinking it's human, and there are limitations to this test, you know, people, it can't just be a chat-based thing, but the idea itself is quite practical if you think about it. Other than playing philosophical games, um, there's no more elegant way to solve the problem, I think, rather than get, this is the asset test, in my opinion. So what does it, so universality, well, what does that mean? Well, Turing discovered that Turing at first, if you think about it, there's a different machine for every piece of software you wanna do, like Candy Crush 2 or, um, I don't know what is it, what it is that kids play these days. One for Quicken, one for Taxes. You could have a different machine, literally a different computer, a different smartphone for every app, a different phone. It wouldn't be a smartphone. It wouldn't be a universal phone. It'd be a dumb phone. It's still useful. And in fact, in the eighties, we were sort of in this situation. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, we had a different machine for playing music. We had a different machine for watching movies. We had a different machine for making coffee. And nowadays the kids are just born with one machine for making all of them. You know, you guys are spoiled. <laughs> so, so you can see how computers, there can be an infinite number of, of, of computers. And Turing was smart enough to realize, wait a minute, there's actually one machine called the universal machine. And all it means is that this is a machine that can simulate or copy the behavior of all machines, including itself, that's all. Just think of it as like a universal chameleon or a universal mirror, a mimic. That's basically how it works. Okay, so software is just basically a way of telling your computer, now be this app. Now be this other app. Now play this game. Now do my taxes for me and so on and so on. One machine that can do an infinite number of machines. It's a very elegant idea. It, 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 it is the one thing that makes computers so practical. Otherwise you'd literally have to print a different computer for every app and computers would just be useless. So anyway, my point is that whether you're looking at cellular automata or whether you're using Python or Mathematica, whether you're using MacBooks or Androids or quantum computers even, neural networks, you know, um, besides our original neural networks, we have one for, for artificial intelligence these days. My point is they may all have different properties. They all look rather different, right? But I claim that they're all exactly the same. This is called the church Turing thesis. There's no proof for it, but the idea is basically that since the decades, nearly a century now, I think, right? Yeah, nearly a century that Turing came up with the idea of computation. Wow, it's been less than a century and we've done so much, but still no near AGI. But the point is that there's no, um, there's no machine that's been found physically realistic, according to what we know of physics, that is more powerful than uh, the humble Turing machine. Basically it can compute no less and no more exactly the same thing. So what are the implications of this idea? Well, Wolfram um, has this idea. Wolfram is one of the guys who uh, originally used computation to try to understand complexity a lot better. He formulated something called a principle of computational equivalence. He said, look, um, you can think of all processes, whether man-made or not, whether what occurs in nature or human thinking, you can look at it as computation. This is what I mean when computer scientists can't help but look at everything because we really do think everything is computable. Okay, let me clarify what this means because this has produced so much misconception, not even funny. 
when I say everything is computable, people like me, not the only one in the universe, not even the original to me, what we computer scientists are saying when we think the universe is computable is that nature is able to basically simulate itself. It's got this property. There's a physical system, and I'll get to it in the next slide. Um, you can think of everything that's, that's occurring in nature as computation. What that means is that there is a machine, there's a computer. Think about what computers need. What, so think about why mathematics are, are, are unreasonably effective at all in describing any of the natural sciences. It, it's not perfect. I'm not claiming it's a perfect thing. But the fact that we have equations for things like predicting the Hill-Bob comet trajectory, think about why that even works at all. I know that there's a lot of um, mistakes that we can make in our modeling and so on, but think about why it's surprising that it even works at all. Why does mathematics even describe nature? And the fact is that it's, it's probably because nature lets you do this in the first place. There's a physical system called computation, what we call computation, what we call universal computation. It's a, it's a, it's a physical system that lets you simulate all physical systems, including itself. So it's like a recursive part of nature where you can use nature to try to understand itself. Otherwise, think about it. You, you wouldn't have intelligence at all if you couldn't use little parts of nature to try to model other parts of nature. That's so why you can make equations about the surface of a star, for example, and run it on your computer. And over time, the idea is that your simulation gets closer and closer to the actual thing. There's less and less of a difference. Um, so, and, and Wolfram also found that basically um, universality is everywhere in nature. To make computers that are this powerful, that can run arbitrary computation, turns out to be very simple. And he's saying that's probably not an accident. It's just the way nature is. Universality is very, very easy to build, even by accident. And so in nature, you tend to get a class of programs that the behavior is not just not simple, they're equivalent in the sophistication of computation they do. So for example, Wolfram likes to say that the weather has a mind of its own. And he's not literally saying that the weather is thinking, he's just saying that if you try to simulate the Earth's climate system, it's probably just as sophisticated as trying to understand what a human brain is trying to do. It's just as complicated, it's just as complex. Doesn't mean it's literally thinking, it's just saying the sophistication is equal. So your grandma and Wolfram, for example, are equally sophisticated, no matter what people say, okay, in terms of trying to simulate them. So this is what I mean by man is computable. If we think the whole universe is computable in the sense that it can be, you can use nature's laws to try to understand nature itself, this is self-similarity part of it, then man, man is a part of nature. You can use computation to try to model human thinking. And so far, this follows from everything we know about the laws of physics, quantum physics at least. Um, Deutsch has a very nice proof in the 1980s about how all finitely realizable quantum physical systems at least can be simulated by a universal quantum computer. Feynman came up with the idea of quantum computation, but not a universal one. Uh, Deutsch discovered it. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, anyway, our friend Joe Shipman also found an interesting thing. Not, if man is computable, then there's a hierarchy of computation called the Chomsky, named after the famous fellow, um, Noam Chomsky. Back in the day, he was he did some great technical work on computationally uh, on, on modeling uh, human languages. Um, and one of it one, one of it is the idea of the hierarchy of computation. They're very simple, roughly can be broken down to four classes of computation. Okay, you, universal machines are up here in the Turing machine level, and then they're very simple machines with very limited memory. They're fixed memory and they, they, they can do simple things like, um, you know, you know, every time you call a phone number and it says press one to do this, press two to do this, that, that's finite automata. Push down automata are more complicated. Um, we don't have to get into, but the point is human beings actually used to be somewhere called a linear bounded automata. What does that mean? It means that we were quite powerful, but not quite universal. Why is that? Uh, because we added memory basically. <laughs> Think about it, at least for you, I, I don't know about you, but for me, writing makes me significantly smarter. That's my secret sauce. So humans were probably 
less capable without paper, without, without writing. Writing made us infinitely smart. So not just speaking, speaking and communicating certainly added a lot of advantage, but being able to write it down and think about it over different generations. Think about how powerful that is. And now that we have computers, for example, so pen and paper, computers, forever changed the world. Um, so even human beings were, were arguably not quite universal, not without adding the technology for it. So this is what I mean by man is universal. What we know from, from computational theory basically is what I'm trying to say is that if it is true that all these machines that we've come up with to try to define what it is to be said to compute at all, all these machines from quantum computers to iPhones, to MacBooks, to cellular automata, DNA computation, whatever, you name it. You can even make computers out of billiard balls. You can make computers out of anything. So people, people like to say, hey, Trishang, isn't this, didn't people make the same mistake, you know, comparing man to steam engines when steam engines were all the rage? Yeah, they did. Um, but I think I argue that what, what difference is a steam engine? You can certainly build a universal steam engine, <laughs> but I'm not going to get to the point. My point is steam engine, the way we used it was still a specialized, it wasn't a universal machine. And what we know from these machines is that if man is computable, he doesn't have special hardware. There, it, it, it is inaccurate, it is incorrect to say that one race has got a special kind of computer that allows it to compute things that another race can never do. Right, so think about it. If a quantum computer cannot compute something that the humble classical typewriter type of machine, the Turing machine cannot, it is certainly incorrect to say that, that some races are fundamentally capable of, of more computation than other races. That is only true if they have more memory, for example. It might allow you to compute more things, but how do you solve that problem? You solve it with technology. Pen and paper, the great equalizer. Computers, the other great equalizer. So technology equalizes uh, differences between people, um, even within the same population. And so I, I like to use, so, and, and this explains uh, convergent evolution. We, we've seen this in people. People are not so radically different that, that you cannot close, you cannot, you cannot ever close the gap between them. So we've seen in, in, in history, for example, two people, it is as if the idea is in the air uh, for the same idea. So for example, evolution, it wasn't just Darwin. There's a fellow called Al Alfred Russell Wallace, who's not so well known. Feynman wasn't the only guy to come up with uh, quantum electrodynamics. There's a Japanese fellow and um, European, Schwinger. Schwinger and, um, damn it, I forget the Japanese guy's name. But you get the idea, three people who came out with basically the same idea. And it took Freeman Dyson to work out the math and figure out, you know what? They're actually exactly talking the same thing, just in a different language. Um, what else? What other, uh, Leibniz, Leibniz and Newton, calculus in the air, same time. Um, Einstein also, I think Maxwell, or, or no, 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 it wasn't Maxwell. It was another mathematician, I forget his name. But basically it had the same basic idea for relativity, but Einstein took it much, much further than a mathematician would have. He, he had a physicist cut. So my point is that no matter, people may look like unreachable goths, but they're not, they're just men. And, and this is what I'm trying to say is that people are capable of arriving at the same thoughts, no matter how different you are. And that can be explained by universality. Just different software for doing, for ultimately getting to the same path. Because we basically have the same hardware. The differences are rather not significant, not as significant as differences in software. Um, the other idea that we can borrow from computation and apply to human beings is the idea of computational irreducibility. This is something that Wolfram came up with. Wolfram noticed that, hey, look, I have. Here's a very simple computer. This is a very simple computer. There's basically eight rules for it. That's it. It's completely closable. It's deterministic. There's nothing random about it. Okay? There's nothing probabilistic about it. Eight simple rules. I start with this simple seed. And all he's asking, all Wolfram is asking is, can anyone predict the final output here after n steps later without going through n steps? Basically, is there a shortcut to all of, the, all of this computation? And he found that if we couldn't do this for this, rel this look like simple machines. They're deterministic. Eight simple rules, completely closed the whole game. It's like chess. And still, 
we cannot predict the behavior of the simple machines because they exhibit complexity. So if we cannot predict the simple machines, what makes us think that we can use something one dimensional like IQ to predict the complex behavior of human beings? And Wolfram goes so far as to say that, you know, this could explain computational irreducibility, could explain things like free will. Even if you live in a completely deterministic world, <laughs> think about it, you don't need randomness to be free. Even in a completely deterministic world, if I can't predict what you're gonna do ahead of time, that's basically relative for you all. It's a really interesting idea. Um, the other thing that we can learn about computation as, as applied to human beings is the idea of the butterfly effect. So you could have the same hardware. You could think of it as the same individual, okay? Same individual. Just think of him as a computable thing. You, you have somehow have his hardware. You somehow have his software, okay? The state of his mind, everything encoded. My point is a single bit flip can change to what we colloquially call the butterfly effect, the sensitivity to initial conditions. You can lead to an entirely different trajectory. And you can see from your own life, the decisions, the rather simple decisions that you made, the black swan kind of events in your life that completely changed your life, right? So the differences between people can be explained by very, very simple things. It's just that you cannot see it in hindsight because it's very hard to trace back the reverse engineering what exactly it was. So there's nonlinear effects in the, in the differences between people. Okay, let's get to objections. Hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, please harass me. I wanna make sure that the idea of universality is clear and why all of this stuff follows. Uh, I'm not claiming that this is a rigorous proof. Sorry, go, go ahead, Mahmoud. No, things, things will become even clearer, I think, once we get to the discussion part. So don't worry about it. Exactly, that. exactly. Rather than just me babbling, let me try to get to that. I don't know, but, okay. but this, is, this is good. This is uh, a lot to take in in one just uh, yeah, in 30 minutes. So, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no, this, okay. is, this is good, this is good. Great, um, okay, so objections. Ah, if I had a penny for every time I heard this, I'd be rich. No, if I had a Bitcoin for every time I heard this, oh, I would have made F human. I'm joking, I'm not a Bitcoin guy. But anyway, people, the first objection that I keep hearing again and again, are you saying man is a machine? Yes and no, but fundamentally, yes, yes, I am saying man is a machine and I don't mean it as an insult. Some people think that I'm like one of those guys who like, okay, to you, everything is a computational, yeah, we get it, to you, the whole damn universe, therefore human beings, uh, you're insulting religion, you're insulting souls, blah, 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 I am not. I am trying to say, and then they say, you're, 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 you're like that guy, uh, Procustes, who, who put his guess in a, in a bed, you know, if it doesn't fit him, so if it doesn't, if the, if the human beings are not computable, I'm trying to deliberately bitter human beings and say that they're computable. I'm not doing this, okay? I'm saying that just because you look at machines today, man-made machines today, and they look pitiful, doesn't mean that we're not machines ourselves. And I say machine, all I mean is it's a, it's a by a machine, I just mean it's a, it's a physical process that follows physical laws. I don't think man is above the laws of nature. A uh, mathematician, no matter how sophisticated he is, cannot escape a black hole. Okay, we get drunk. <laughs> it affects our brain, it affects our thinking. So even if you have a soul, whatever it is inside, it is subject to, to, to physical laws. That's all I'm saying. A machine is just something that follows physical laws. Everything to me in the universe is a machine. That's what I mean by a machine. Um, and we haven't figured out, and I like to call it complex technology. We don't have complex technology. We have simple technology. Uh, we have technology that man knows how to completely reverse engineer and understand, but we don't have technology, complex technology, the original pioneers, of course, nature, using DNA to program human beings and everything. So man is software, basically. Nature is the original programmer. Got billions of... Um, uh, DNA alphabets now, and the interpretation is complex, right? So this is what I'm trying to say. Just because I'm saying a man is a machine, I'm not trying to butcher, uh, uh, we could be wrong. I could be wrong. We could be wrong saying that man is computable, the universe is computable. But so far, what we know about the laws of nature, what we know about computation is that it looks like everything is computable. 
So, so that's what I mean. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. Some people may still be offended or insulted. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm not trying to deliberately do this, trust me. Um, if you're religious about it, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't care. Like, like, believe what you want. All I'm saying is, if you just take our axiom that everything is computable, these things follow. Just think about it that way. You don't even have to agree with me. Just suppose the axiom is true. Then you can see how all of these things follow. And you can attack me technically from there. If these things don't follow, attack me on that. If we don't share the axiom, I'm sorry, we can't have a discussion. So end of story. Okay, uh, and then some people, you know, try to use my own argument against me and say, oh yeah, sure, man is computable. So that must mean that some racers are like, they must have like better CPUs, right? Uh, they must have like a Intel 4.0 gigahertz overclock, all that crap. And, and they have bigger RAMs, right? They have one terabyte of RAM compared to this other inferior race. Yeah, this is cute, but so there's several arguments against this. One is that you can't use simple computers like human beings. I mean, sorry, our man-made Intel machines and so on, our chips, okay, like my, like my phone here, and compare it to natural computers, which are vastly more sophisticated. They just work, work very differently. Think about how parallel and distributed the brain is. None of our computers are anything like that. You can't take a linear thing like CPU speed and RAM size that applies to man-made computers and apply to natural computers. It's not clear at all that they immediately transfer. That's one. Number two, um, what's more important is not the hardware, it's the software. So here, for example, I have a cute little demonstration. And those of you who program know this, it's called a big O. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that there's a, there's a very dumb, so assume, that there are two people running basically. So basically one hardware is twice as fast. This guy hardware, let's say is twice as fast. Let's just go ahead with this argument and say someone has got a CPU twice as fast as yours. Okay, compared to your CPU. And you can still get ahead because your algorithm is smarter. As opposed to this dumb one that takes more time. You see? So, so it's not just hardware, you have to think about software. Maybe someone is very, very slow, like Gregory Perl Perlman, who is a great mathematician. He claims, he admits that he's very slow, but his advantage over other people is that he thinks much more deeply than other people. That's software. So even if you take his word for it, that he is a slow guy, let's call it slow hardware. He may be able to out endure you, for example, in a task, making him look vastly smarter when all he did was persevere. You're sounding too platonic and too Cartesian, my friend. Oh no, ah, there we, we go. This we'll is, get this... there, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, I'm very curious to, 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 to know what this means. Okay, and the other, thing is, uh, the other thing is that right now, you can make a distinction between hardware and software and man-made computers. In natural computers, this is not clear. Our, our brain is able to, to rewire itself to use loose um, man-made metaphors. The more we learn something, the more we think about something, the better we get at it because we're literally printing new circuits. No, no man-made computer does that. So just because you're better or faster at something doesn't mean you were born with it. It means you learned your way there. Oh yeah, big word award, neuroplasticity. There we go, exactly. I give myself this award. Okay, and then some people say, I've got 10 minutes self-imposed, another 10 minutes left. Other people say, aren't geniuses like exponentially smarter? I don't even know what this means. They never define it. So I took the trouble of defining for them. There's two models of computation. One is very linear. This is basically the sort of computers we have today. They basically do one thing at a time. Even if they're multitasking, running different apps at the same time. Yeah, there's multi-cores and all of that stuff. But basically, at some point, once you run enough software, they're all basically taking turns very, very quickly. It's like a bee or, or a hummingbird, very, very quickly taking turns doing different things. So it looks like it's running different things at the same time all at once, like this computer on the, on the other end, but it's not, it's just an illusion. This is running faster than human perception. So it looks parallel, but it's not. And then they're truly parallel machines. So, so I, I, I define this argument for them and say that, um, Exponentially smarter people are, are like these parallel machines that can branch forever and keep going. And they can just do exponentially more work than 
us pitiful little muggles here. It's a genius isn't just a muggle, right? I'm, I'm in this category and geniuses are just, you know, geniuses like the intellectual dark web uh, are in this category. And I'm saying that this is very unlikely to be true because if we could build a computer like this, we don't know, by the way, whether we can build computers like this, but if you can build computers like this, you can solve an open problem in computer science called P, whether B equals NP or not. I don't want to get into the technical details, but basically it would ruin a lot of cryptography. A lot of things about, a lot of things we can't prove are true, but are probably true about the intrinsic difficulty of computing something. So it's very unlikely to be true. Most likely we're all like this and there's some polynomial differences between people, nothing significant. What, what I think most people miss is that geniuses tend to work on high risk, high reward projects that most people don't want to go into. Okay, so just because few people go here in the first place and a few come out, even fewer come out, they look like gods, but they're not. And, and, and then finally, the, the last objection, I think, no, no, to second last one. Are you saying we're all the same? No, I'm saying basically we all have the same sort of hardware. So let's not talk about the stupid bogus idea that some races are better. It's not, it's not true. What differentiates us is what we do with our time with our brains, we're here, we can all communicate. We all have languages, okay? It doesn't matter what your skin color are, we can all understand each other. So that alone tells you something, okay? So, so you need to think about, so, and we know from computation, here's the most important thing, by the way, a lot of people misunderstand computation and think that there is one method to solve all problems. There isn't, that is the thing that we learned from Gödel and Turing and Post and so on and Chaitin. It emphasizes, he totally opened my mind. He blew my mind. People misunderstand Gödel. People say Gödel means, okay, to be fair, we don't necessarily know the full implication of Gödel. Either did Gödel, by the way. There are two possibilities. One is man is uncomputable, in which case we can throw all of this pretty much out of the window. But bear with me and say we're in the camp of man is computable. What does this say about human beings? It means that there's no one human who can solve all problems just like there is no one algorithm to solve all decision problems. There is no one genius who can solve all problems. It it's just doesn't follow from computational theory. So you need randomness and creativity. That's why individuals you know, are different. They're like different formal systems with different rules and different axioms. They just think differently. And they're able to see things that you cannot because you didn't come, you didn't start with the same initial conditions. You don't have the same software. I think nature wouldn't have bothered making individuals if they weren't value to, do, to, to being an individual. Otherwise, it would all be more like ants. So even in math, there is, believe it or not, even in mathematics, they, what do they tell you? That mathematics is more certain than physics. This is not true. You have been misinformed. This is an urban legend. Mathematicians do not want to talk about this. But even in mathematics, there is no fundamental certainty. Sometimes you just have to take some things on faith. They call it axioms, fancy words, and roll with it and see where it takes you. You find new areas of mathematics never seen before. So even in math, you have to be creative. Math is biological, not a machine. Well, not a, not a simple fixed machine. It's a complex machine. Okay, anyway, bottom line. You do you. Don't let people put you into boxes and tell you your IQ is 181, 180, sorry. Therefore, you're worse than someone with 181. You're superior than someone with 100. Um, don't let people beg you. Intell intellectually, it is, they, they, they want to measure you. They want to rank you. All these nerds want to put a number on you and say, this is you. You never change over time. This is, this is wrong. If, if, if simple computer programs can, can learn, so can you. And you're vastly more sophisticated. You're an, you're an older type of computer. Been around for billions of years at least. Use it. Um, be creative, right? Do your thing. Like I said, you're part of nature's distributed search. What are, what are you, and, and you know, this may sound a little bit, some scientists have problems with this kind of language. They're saying it's as if there's a purpose to, to, to natural processes. I'm not saying a divine process put you here. You can believe it if you want, nothing wrong with it. But there is something special about you. Use it. Go, go out there and find out what, 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 what you're good for. Okay, that's it, basically. Um, thanks for your time. Hopefully that made sense. Um, you can read more of the um, arguments here. And um, yeah, let's, let's discuss, please. Throw, throw all the insults at me. Thank you very much. Uh, this is good.
uh, you really this this talk really I think uh, led to a platonic Cartesian. No, conclusion. this is the exact uh, opposite I, I'll, that I'll I wanted to go to. But but please go ahead. I'll I'll explain what this means shortly. But first off, uh, two people thus far have. Uh, raised objections or maybe some clarification. I'll, I'll get to those. But in the meantime, uh, anyone here who has a question, uh, you can either raise your hand or uh, you can just write down uh, your question in the chat box and then I'll, I'll make sure to, to read that. Uh, and before I, uh, uh, Rudy has something to say before I let you ask your question, Rudy, or raise your objection. I just want you to clarify something, please, for us. When you say software, when it comes to human beings, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I mean things like personality, things like um, the stuff you were born with. Clearly, we're not born blank slates. Clearly, we're born with a lot of programming. Plato. Sorry? Plato. You're, you're, you're Plato, oh man. You're Plato. How, Today you're how Plato. did I become the thing I was striving to avoid? You're Plato this and the This is so Freudian. I became the thing I was trying to... I'm very yes. anti-Platonist, actually. It's, this, it's the traditional mathematicians who are, who I call Platonists. In a not so flattering way. So, so you're, so you're, yeah. Well, Descartes. If you, if you don't like to be called Platonic, let's Descartes. Okay, let me, let me explain this, uh, and then you can explain the software bit, and then I'll, I'll let the, the rest go, uh, or uh, ask the questions. So Descartes and the rationalists. See, this is where Leibniz and these people were coming from. Uh, the reason they were saying that, uh, in the way you put it, the universe is computable. Uh, what they meant was they, they were trying to understand the structure of the world and their claim was that through reason, by only using reason, mm -hmm. we can actually understand and know reality, mm -hmm. know the world, know how mm -hmm. the world works, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. because we are already equipped okay. with this, whatever it is you want to Got call it. it. So we are born with innate ideas. Yeah. Uh, whatever this means, right? So we are born with some sort of, if you are calling it software, and this software allows us to think about the world in a way that would allow us to understand uh, the fundamental structures of everything, including laws of nature, including math, including uh, things like right and wrong, etc. So that's that's great. So one thing, remember that I call David Hilbert's problem, the decision problem, the greatest IYI top down, the greatest IYI top down reason enlightenment project of them all. Why? Because it wanted to use reason to objectively solve all problems, right? And I forgot to answer the question. Is there a machine that can solve all yes and no questions? There isn't. I, I forgot to mention that and I didn't want to derail the discussion, but that is the biggest thing we learned from trying to define computers. We got this very useful machines. They're infinitely useful, but actually you can use reason to prove that there's an uncountably infinite number of things they can never ever do. It's not a question of time, money. You just need a fundamentally different class of computers. And then they in turn will have their own limitations and then you need a higher class. It's like an endless um, class system of computers. And so far, we only know how to build the lowest class. The digital computers, the Turing machines that we have today, even then they're, they're, they're not perfect. We, we don't know whether there's such a thing as really infinite memory and so on. So, but anyway, the point is you can use reason ironically to show that there are limits to reason. There are logical limits to reason, things you can never do. That's the difference yeah. between us and them. Uh, but, but this, yes, and, and this, is, uh, this is basically what Kant uh, did. And that's why I wrote the follow-up uh -huh. article to try to explain Kant and I used your article, the first one. So, but, but yeah, software in this case, again, is it, is it, is it innate ideas? I'm, I'm trying to clarify this bit so that uh, afterwards I can say whether I, or not. The, the, the full opinion. answer is I, yeah, I, I, I don't pretend to have a, a, a precise uh, definition of what, what I mean by software in, the human, uh, in human beings. By hardware, I'm saying more like, you know, things like brains and, you know, every human being roughly shares the same kind of meat. Right, we all have okay. neurons, that yeah. sort of thing. And, and software and is the thing. Sorry, the qualities are emergent. Are you say are like complexity is an emergent kind of uh, quality yeah. of human beings, and so mm -hmm. software is 
grounded in this hardware, but then it's much more than that. It's more than exactly. The sum of the you can have like endless layers of software. You can have lower layers of software that are quite dumb, and then they they lead to uh, very interesting things like consciousness. If you try to pin down consciousness, the old-fashioned reductionist way, you can't do it. Yep. Yep. I agree with you, and uh, yes, my verdict is that you're you're. Uh, you lean more towards the uh, Plato slash. Uh, oh oh the god! Side. Maybe we with the innate can, ideas. <laughs> we can discuss this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Later, but before oh, that, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rudy had something to say, and then Sarah, and then I'll uh, jump to the yeah. questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, very, very quickly, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I completely agree with the first statement. You know that it's really stupid and looks racial if you categorize different groups of people per definition and you. Uh, put them in the low IQ bucket. I, I believe that's that's absolutely true. But I think, you know, I based on my experience, privately and also professionally, so I, I just have to say this, I'm a mathematician, I have a degree in computer science in, in applied statistics. Uh, I believe on an individual level, it's not so easy. I mean, I, I really believe, you know, I mean, look, I'm not a Gödel and I'm not a Wittgenstein, and I try to read both the works of both, right? And there are people who are more capable at grasping complex things than others. Uh, what, what you can say is, I mean, I, I don't want to, this is not my argument, but what, what a Jordan Peterson would say about IQ and he talked about it, I just say this very quickly. He says, you know, the US military doesn't hire anybody even in wartime with an IQ below 83 because they believe they're not trainable based on, I guess, you know, experience, you know. Uh, so, and this is one tenth of the population. What I can say is this, you know, even in families, we have like three kids, four kids, twins, for whatever reason, and we don't know exactly what happens, the outcomes are not the same. Even if they're raised in the same household, some of them are extremely chess players or extremely, uh, I don't know, become professors, you know, uh, and uh, at, uh, in universities, and some of them are, are, are not quite making it. Obviously, there's, there's, it's multidimensional. I, I completely understand, but I think you know, on the individual level, at least, you know, we see. We see you and every educator might might say this, you know, we see really the same input doesn't produce the same output. You know, that's what I want to say. It's not like, you know, everybody has access to all this information yeah, yeah, and everybody right. becomes a genius at the end. That's that's not working, unfortunately, not, not at all. Yeah, that's, and I'm that's not saying that everyone, everyone is an idiot or everyone is a genius. I'm saying that everyone is capable of. And this needs some qualification. So in principle, everyone is capable of exactly the same thoughts. It's the same range of computation. But we know in practice that this is not true. And why I claim has got to do with software, not really hardware. Look at the hardware. It's what we are, the things, the things about you you can control, like what you learn, what you do with your time, right? That sort of thing. And then there are things about you you have no control over, even geniuses, like how you learn or what interests you or what family you were born with, what time you were born with, what place, all of these things contribute to who you are as a person. So yes, there, there are, you know, even between two peers, even in the same technical field, yeah, they may look like, you know, they may say, yeah, this guy is a genius. We're all basically in the same league, but that guy is a genius. And, and, but that can still be explained by, by software. Sure, Patricia, can I just ask you this? Did you ever encounter some, uh... Some, some people where they explained concepts that were, I mean, at least it happened to me, you know, they were out of my reach, I believe, you know, intellectually. And I'm really saying this. It's not, there are people uh, in my field who are really, I mean, I'm not bad at all. I don't want to do this, but there are people who grasp things faster and more intuitively than I, I could ever do it. And, and, and here I would say, I, I would attribute this most likely to, I guess IQ, you know, I'm not 180. I'm just saying this. And it doesn't matter if I'm 183 or 181. I'm none of this. I'm, I'm just I, saying. I, I don't think it's IQ. This is why I disagree. It's, it's what I call programming. It's what I call software. You're just, you're, you're uh, let's, let's use a loose metaphor. Your, your formal axiom system, your, your programming leads you to different ways of thinking than the other guys. There's nothing mysterious about it if you look at it that way. It's just what different software do. They lead to different outcomes. When you think of it that way, there's really nothing mysterious about it. Just, just try to think about it that way and see, and then we can we can argue. Okay. Yeah. It. Thank you. Yeah. No. No. Thanks. No. I, I, 
Okay, thanks. Thanks for your answer. And and I yeah. think it has it has something to do with the fact that it's irreducible. Like we cannot pin it down and say that this is the cause of this or that result. So exactly, the outcome is more complex because it's indeterminable. It's because it's because of all these uncertainties. Because there, you might have had this exposure when you were five and ten, and you've read this and you've read that. So the outcome is maybe perhaps unpredictable. Is that it? Exactly, irreducibility is not the word, but but uh, it's it's opaque. You can't reverse engineer and pinpoint. Aha! This was the thing that made the genius secret sauce. Okay, but would you select based on this? You know, because you know, obviously, if you want to hire for a certain position, I mean, are you against selecting, or do you think everybody's trainable to to do so, almost everything? Listen, like 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 Nassim was saying. Look, I mean, like, sure, you probably don't want to hire. IQ is probably good for only one thing: filtering the idiots. But look. I mean, sir, they shouldn't even put it that way. Look, there are people who are born unfortunate. We know this. There is no point insulting them by, by calling them low IQ. Yeah, Our true. job, you are lucky if you were born normal. Our job is to protect them. They're weaker than us. To deliberately denigrate them and call them subhuman and subpar and all of that, like, like what the hell is the point? I agree, um, I agree 100%. And, and, I agree and for the rest 100%. of us, yeah, and for the rest of us, what is the number going to help for? You look at a you look at a person and they work, and you can tell them, yeah, I don't need your IQ. Who needs to see Wolfram's IQ at this point? Do you need to see his IQ to say, aha, now this is the thing that proves to me you're a genius? No, you look at his body of work and say, you you can do things I cannot do, and I can do things you cannot do, and we value you know the output of different different works differently. So there's that. Uh, sorry, 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 I had a question. And uh, it doesn't go the other way around. So it, you can only de determine this after the fact, like Feyerabend would say. And it's curious that, uh, I, for, I, I uh, how do you pronounce it, the, the last name? Uh, George Chaitlin, was it? Uh, uh, George Chaitlin, Chaitlin. Yeah, Chaitlin. I think it's Chaitlin. Yeah. Against yeah. method, this is very against method. It's for it's for yeah. Right? For, for for yeah. Right? There we go. That's yeah. Uh, that's this is interesting. I'll I'll ask you to say something about this uh, later. But then uh, Sarah and Sarah had something to say. So Sarah Khala first, and then uh, the other Sarah can. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to push back on Mahmoud your comment about this being Plata the software being for Plato and Descartes. Yes. Because yes. Yes. Um, I'm ready to push back, but yes, tell me. Uh, from what I understand from Trishank's, uh, what he said, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's not just what you're born with and what your innate, what comes when, with you when you're born, it's the stuff that you gain as you, so it's path dependent. So as right. you move through life, the stuff that comes at you and how that formulates um, the software in your head. So the analogy I have in my mind is if the computer is the hardware and then the operating system is the software and then your experiences have you turn some different apps on and off, some different programs on and off and that's why you see and do different things. So less emphasis on what you're born with, more emphasis on what you gain from your path. Absolutely. But then what you're born with allows you to kind of gain knowledge and grow this knowledge and acquire new things and understand how the world is. Because without this, we cannot acquire knowledge. So it's the same thing. It's like you're, you already have this sort of built-in software, like the concepts, like some uh, things like uh, right and wrong and uh, the concept of substance and causality and stuff like that. And then this allows us to uh, make sense of the world, to, to do mental operations, kind of. That, that is also true. So I agree with both of you. Um, yeah. I agree with Sarah that there's uh, been not enough emphasis on the reprogrammability, the infinite yep. plasticity of human beings. Uh, People, IQ tends to put you into a mole and says you cannot get out of it. That's a bad idea. Let's bust it. That's, that's the one thing. The second thing is that it is also true that we're born with some constraints. So for example, we don't see infrared. And Noam Chomsky actually talks about this. He thinks necessarily you must have constraints in order to be able to do useful things at all. Like things like having two hands, two legs, why not three or four? But having limits actually helps you, helps, try, anyway. The, the point is we, we use technology to compensate for some of humanity's own limitations, like pen and paper, for example, gives us even more memory. 
So there's also that. But then, so if I if we go with what Noam Chomsky said, uh, we can't see infrared. So that's part of the the constraints are available for everybody. We don't have some right. people exactly. that can see infrared. Exactly, exactly. So I ascribe that from my understanding to the hardware part. Right, right. Than the software part. Exactly, and and if it looks like, and then they will push the argument further. You, you know, some of the racialists they might push the argument and say, "Yeah, sure, maybe we all can see infrared." But this race, if you keep looking at it, somehow keeps producing superior results. It must mean that we have some mental, the mental equivalent of seeing an infrared that other races don't have. And you can say, "Well, no, that's bogus. That could also be explained by um, just different ways of thinking, and network effects, and advantage, right? Initial advantage." It's hard to catch up with, especially if you plunder entire nation's wealth first, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, yeah, build your way to success from there. Kind of easy to do. So, uh, yeah, this is interesting. I think uh, in in my case, we're talking about uh, two different things. I will have to to clarify this also a bit, but it's an interesting discussion. I'll have to think about it when it comes to this: Are we born as a blank slate or not? And Trishank thinks that we are not born as a, as a blank slate, that there is some sort of innate, whatever it is. And it's interesting to think about the nature of these things, but this is, uh, I'll, I'll leave that uh, for later. Uh, in the meantime, the, Sarah, you had something to say? Yeah. yeah, just thank you so much. That was so good. And just a lot of really great points there, seeds that are, are sinking in. I guess I get the sort of arguments against IQ now. Uh, I think Nassim has talked about it in terms of deficits, that it measures deficits in um, psychological functioning. Um, and I guess in terms of, I guess my thought was, you know, we're sort of, you've talked about the uniqueness of people and that we're really a combination of unique deficits and abilities that, that, that generate output or, um, define our functioning in the world. So both people who might be sort of on the ends of that Gaussian curve might have some very unique combinations of, of deficits and abilities that um, result in interesting output. In terms of the creativity piece, um, I can't pronounce, one of the, I can't pronounce his name, the Czechoslovakian uh, psychologist who wrote about flow and he also wrote oh, about six, six and Mihaly, apparently. Oh, I knew you could say it. Good for you. Someone, um, someone just told me how to do it, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, that he, I didn't like what he said about creativity initially, but that, that you can only measure creativity by output. Um, and so anyways, I don't know about the measurement piece, but, uh, it was definitely interesting um and and the forces that shape us you know in combination with the deficits and gifts but i guess my question was you know i like what you said about we're computable so if we're computable what does that mean for us like i uh it it could mean something very very good that we're not uh taking advantage of there are two things I think if we're computable, all I'm saying is that the laws of physics, the laws of nature apply to, to us just like the rest of nature. Okay, so we're not special in that sense. There are good and bad things about it. The bad thing is that if it is true that computers cannot do an uncomputably infinite number of things, then neither can humans. Maybe this is wrong. Maybe humans are just a different kind of more powerful hypercomputers as they call them. Maybe we are, we don't know. But so far, we haven't seen any evidence to say that human beings can solve the kind of problems that computers, digital computers cannot do. Okay, so that's one thing, is that it places logical limits on what we can do. The logical limits of nature, rest of nature, why not us? It makes sense. For the same reason that you cannot escape a black hole, you can't escape um, computational limits either. Um, so that's one. I, I, don't, I don't see what's so mysterious about it. Why, why should this be surprising? Mm. Um, and I, the second thing is, sorry. No, I was just thinking about, I know it kind of has maybe a sketchy reputation, but, but uh, in th terms of things like NLP and things like that, that actually do try to uh, use that approach 
approach to yeah yeah uh, and 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 this is where I'll push back. So some of the good implications that follow that from the man is un, un, uh, man is computable is that um, basically all hardware is the same. Man is universal. We're all capable of the same kind of things. The re, the things that really end up differentiating us in practice is software. There are things about it you can control. There are things about it you cannot control. Now let's talk about some of the bad parts of this metaphor that people have abused. You can try to take really simple things about computation, like, like programming, our very pitiful programs, and say that that applies to human beings too, right? Maybe people think linearly. Yeah, some people think linearly, especially IYIs. And it's very easy to exploit them. But to say that you can fool human beings all around the same, I, I mean, that's my rough understanding of NLP. There are a few tricks you can use, you know, things like, Things like what pickup artists roughly say that, you know, all women are basically the same and you can woo them all the same way. If you just um, take my, you know, my, my special class in it, uh, people are not that simple. So we cannot take, we cannot take what we know about programming simple systems, simple man-made technology, simple man-made computers and extrapolate it naively to complex organic computers that are not so easy to reverse engineer and figure out how to manipulate. Now, of course, as human beings, you know, psychologists use fancy words like theory of mind. We have rough ideas of how other human beings work, what makes them tick. We can try, but there's still no guarantees. So you can call it programming, but unfortunately, there are people who compare people too much to simple deterministic machines. That, that is a bad idea. That we shouldn't do. Does this roughly answer your question? Sorry, maybe it doesn't. Hey, thanks, thanks, Ethan. Yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, my bone basically with things like NLP and, and simple, yeah, sorry, computational metaphors. Sorry, Mamu, uh, you, you were saying something. But excuse me if I uh, don't uh, pronounce correctly your names, but uh, Zahid is saying uh, maybe genius is a dimension of intelligence. We don't comprehend at all. Is it possible that we are trying to build a narrative around it until the time we understand it completely? Is this possibility uh, we should account for? Maybe IQ is not the appropriate scale or measure? Yeah, I think that's partly what, what Nassim is trying to say. No one, so, so listen, no, what, what is this is famous saying? Nobody, nobody knows what they're talking about when they talk about religion. I think you can say the same thing about things like intelligence, consciousness, genius. I don't claim to know what I'm talking about here either. Like if you really, really press me for um, what, what does software mean at the human level? I don't know. I'm taking rough steps, rough conjectures, I'm making speculations. I can say things like personality and everything. I can make some rough distinctions, but I cannot precisely delineate. Uh, right, okay. so. I, I don't know if this answers your question, Zahid. Probably uh, not. Uh, sure. Sanjay is saying, I am absolutely with you. I, I hope uh, they're still here uh, with you on the claim that IQ is a broken concept. I have also been very intrigued by the idea of the universe as a computer for a long time. Just a few points from my perspective. One, perhaps we need a narrower axiom to make the argument that intelligent behavior is in essence a computation rather than everything is computation. Uh, two, intelligence is to me uh, to me is problem solving. Creativity is part of problem solving and hence intelligence. Any thoughts? So first that we need a narrower axiom to make the argument that intelligent behavior is in essence a computation rather than everything is a computation. And intelligence is problem solving and creativity is part of problem solving and hence intelligence. Um, I would say for one, actually the other way around is simpler. <laughs> If you think about it, if you just assume everything is computable, well, you don't even have to assume there's actually a proof for it, at least what we, what we know from the known laws of physics. If everything is computable, it follows trivially, at least if you think man is part of nature and nothing more, that we are also computable, you see? <laughs> it's actually much simpler. Um, as for two and three, yeah, maybe. I don't know. This uh, this also reminds me of some, yeah, I, I don't want to get into this, but uh, this definitely gives me uh, uh, material to think about. Uh, cool. Yeah, was particularly when it comes to German idealism, but that's something that we can discuss also later. 
Uh, and also Zahid asks, uh, how do we know that creativity is not a sub part of genius? I mean, sure, it probably is. Cre cre again, if you, if you ask me to define what creativity means, I, I probably can't give you a precise definition, but I think it has to be. Necessarily, you have to be creative to be a genius. Otherwise, can anyone call you a genius? If, it's, if, it's, if the solution is so obvious in hindsight, would anyone call you a genius? That's why we call you creative. You're able to see things in a completely new, different way, right? Partly that's what we mean by creativity. So yeah, sure. Uh, there's something along the lines of what the romantics uh, thought about when they uh, thought about or had in mind when they thought about genius. They wrote a lot about the, the concept, right? Uh, to have some sort of aesthetic and intellectual intuition and then to cultivate, they call aesthetic education of, of man, uh, sort of speak, to be able to apprehend beauty and culture, etc., cetera, and nature. But uh, yeah, uh, Sanjay also... Uh, says there's a bit of issue with hardware software demarcation in human context as software learning does modify some of our hardware yeah, exactly yeah mm -hmm. yeah exactly this is what i was talking about with the neuro neuroplasticity no man made computer does this so yeah you're right our our heart our software can actually probably change our hardware think about it that's crazy that's if we could have computers like that it would be fascinating computers that modify themselves think about it uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, mispronouncing, sorry for that. Shreyanj is saying quite right uh, when it comes to the innate things. Everyone's by default programmed for reproduction and other basic functions for survival. So it may not be a blank slate. Well, yes, a biological kind of blank slate. But then if we're talking mm -hmm. at the level of concepts and, and things like that, this is where the tricky bit comes in. It's like the entire discussion is, are what are ideas and concepts and how do we uh, is it material or is it not material or is it in our brain or is it somewhere Ooh, else that's the tricky one that's yeah. the real deep philosophical rabbit hole there <laughs> yeah i that's know where i am on this but people hate me for this uh, i come from a long line of materialists mati it's but this is this is this is why i'm saying it's like if, if it's grounded in in the material aspect but then it's emergent like uh, varela and right, right. talks about talk about this right and uh, it's something to think about. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but and and you've somewhat convinced me with the uh, premise or the uh, yeah that uh, all uh, or the assertion more than premise that everything is computational or that everything is also machine. But uh, your definition of what a machine is is much different than what others think of a machine to be like. So yeah. Uh, I, I think, um, um, how am I I'm mispronouncing your name? Sorry, uh, Anna has a question. Where, uh, oh, uh, no, yeah, yeah. Anna, Anna Albert is, Albert. is ah, there. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading the chat box. Ah, okay. But yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, as I see if there are any, any questions. Yeah, I, I, I find that this univers universality idea a, a very a nice idea, first, particularly because it's so, so simple. I'm wondering to, to what extent you can apply it. Like now we're talking about intelligence and like thoughts that you can have and concepts you can understand. But does it also mean that in principle I could be a Lionel Messi or a Cristiano Ronaldo? Like does it actually no, also no. extend to physical activity? So that's a good question. I'm not talking about physical traits like height or weight. Well, weight mm -hmm. we can change with dieting. So at least we have some control over that. Height, you know, I've been trying forever to increase my own height to be more like Lionel. Is Lionel Messi a tall guy? Presumably. Oh, no, no, he's small. He's small. He's well, small. It's, it's ah, okay. mainly so, about the movement, right? I think in sports, like it's it's the movement of your muscles, which seems so yeah. to be some kind of computation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so, okay. So, clearly, there are some physical things about you you can you cannot change. Mm -hmm. But. And, and, and it matters more on things like, even if you think about sports, it's not representative of real life, right? Just because yeah. you're good at football doesn't mean you're good at rugby, for example. So there's some necessary trade-off even for relatively simple things there. Now for the human mind, is that the equivalent of something like uh, height in basketball, where height is presumably very important in basketball, right? Maybe there are some mental um concepts some ideas you need to have in your head 
you know how there's some people, some students, and there's nothing wrong with them. They just cannot see something. Mm -hmm. This is the famous American Thanksgiving dinner thing. They just can't see my point of view. There's nothing stupid about them. There's nothing that physically limits them from seeing your point of view. They just have mental blocks. Yeah. It's, it's not like a fundamental barriers. They're programming, for the lack of a better word, prevent also, them from being to able sports, to see. It's a bit right? arbitrary when it comes to sports. Like we, we devise these set of rules and then all of a sudden these people become more qualified and play right, better, right. you know. But, we're so choosing for something there, exactly. We're, we're deliberately- A Wittgenstein for... ruler kind of thing or, yeah. or something along the lines. It's exactly. not the other we're... way around. Exactly, we're choosing for something particular there that does not even necessarily gen generalize the rest of life. Like football plays, great, you're the greatest soccer, good for you. Doesn't mean anything about the rest of your life. Um, that's one thing. Um, and the second thing is, um, I. You know, weightlifting, I've seen something interesting, which is that when you stop lifting weights for a while, it's not like you lose muscle necessarily. Let's say one or two weeks. A few months is a different story. You lose the neuromuscular connection, the ability to recruit, recruit all the muscles. So you have the same strength. So what I'm trying to say, people like Messi have, they have both. They have good mind body coordination there's a certain level of programming there it's not just something you're born with it's something you have to train yourself to do messi wasn't just born a soccer god as a baby yeah sure he's got some physical traits that helps him get there better but something no one talks about is his mind is also probably better equipped to use that body think about it there might be a lot of potential messies i could be a potential messy but maybe my software is just not as good because we have the same height apparently so there's some hope, but maybe the difference is that my mind is not so good to use my body in the same way that he is. And that's, that's things you cannot control. Those are things you're born with. So why worry about things you cannot control? Worry about things you can control, the particular gifts you're born with and use them well, find, find the niche that makes the best use of your skills, right? Yeah, yeah it, makes, it makes a lot of sense, thanks. Uh, and uh, maybe the last question before we wrap it up, uh, Rajat yeah, uh, asked, uh, is it possible to reverse engineer a genius like Elon Musk if we know about his personality and other components of his software as explained by Trishank? No, I don't think so. The human mind is not only too complicated, it is complex. Even if there's a simple layer, of, even if there's a simple program that can ultimately reproduce Musk, good luck trying to reverse engineer it. The short answer is no, it's not that simple. Sorry, no 15, 15 rules of life for being Elon Musk. And Why do you want to be like Musk anyway? It, it, exactly, it's, it's like even if you can reverse engineer, this doesn't, uh, like you cannot, there is no formula in a way because can, the conditions and as you were saying, the software might be also different because the, due to all sorts of conditions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's something to think about. This, this also reminds me of existentialism. Like, yeah, uh, you, th this has definitely been interesting for me. I'll have to think about all this and I'll get no, back. No, thank you. And we should, we should, I'd, I'd love to uh, continue this conversation, Gunnar, especially because you accused me of being uh, Platonist. Well, to defend my reputation here. If, if you have some time uh, next, uh, next month, I think uh, you can uh, uh, join our uh, knowledge and reality course. I love it. When, I love uh, it. Yeah. Particularly the Kant bit. Like I'll, I'll invite you to, to join this bit. We can, we can discuss Kant. I got to read up on this guy now. Relation to, I got to buy everything he's ever written. No, 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 you cannot. It's, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, uh, Kant is very <laughs> difficult to, to digest as well. But then the idea is there, you know, the limitation of reason and what we can and cannot do at a software level and a hardware level as well. But then a lot of things there. So, yeah, uh, at least uh, this, uh, this, this has been very interesting to me. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any no, no, questions. No, I did. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you can uh, pester Trishank uh, on Twitter. Uh, his handle, I'll, I'll share his handle, or you can write your handle in the in the chat if they don't already follow you on Twitter. And uh, I did not uh, ask you why you don't like uh, cats, but then we leave this for another chat. But then cats are much better than dogs. And no. No argument there. First Platonist, now this. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. So uh, really, thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, no, no, thank you. It's been an honor. Uh, this this has been uh, great. So uh, I'll I'll be posting the the chat on on YouTube and sharing on uh, uh, Twitter. So thank you guys. Sounds good. Have a see you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Bye now. Cheers.